Good afternoon and welcome to the first lecture in the Department of Studio Arts Fall Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Gerald Otten and I direct the Studio Art Exhibition Program. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to ask you all to turn off your cell phones, power books, what else is there, iPhones, anything electronic in order not to uh, interfere with our speaker. There's plenty of seats down here. It's a pleasure today to introduce you to you our fall term artist in residence, a painter, Rebecca Purdom. Born in Idaho Falls, Idaho, she attended St. Martin's School of Art in London, Syracuse University where she received the BFA, and Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. She currently lives and works in Ripton, Vermont. Rebecca has exhibited extensively here and abroad. Solo exhibition venues include the MIT List Visual Arts Center, Middlebury College of Art, and since 1986, numerous solo exhibitions at Tilton Gallery, New York, by whom she is represented. Group exhibitions include Regional Selections 30 at the Hood Museum of Art, Alive and Well, Elizabeth Harris Gallery, New York, Repicturing Abstraction at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and the 1991 Whitney Biennial and an exhibition that I saw in Milwaukee years ago, 10 plus 10, Contemporary Soviet and American Painters uh, that traveled to San Francisco, Washington, Moscow, and Tbilisi. Uh, her honors and awards are numerous and they include a Joan Mitchell Foundation grant, Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award, a Paul Branson Memorial Award from the National Society of Arts and Letters, and several Ford Foundation grants. Her collections include the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, the List Visual Arts Center, Museum of Art Munson Williams Proctor Institute at Utica, New York, and the Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University. In the essay that accompanies Purdom's exhibition in the Jaffe Freedy Gallery, Sister Wendy Beckett makes the following remarks on her work. Quote, Purdom encounters every canvas directly, bodily. She paints with her hands, unable to bear the intermediaries of brush and palette. As she works, the total absorption of her activity transcends itself into what seems as near as possible, a resolution. For work of such scope, there can never be resolution. But here we come as close as the artist can bring us to an awareness of that something beyond, which words can never describe. This is art of great visual beauty, and yet I would dare to describe it as beyond the visual." Unquote. Uh, Rebecca will be available during the term to meet with students individually and will no doubt speak to classes about her work in the gallery. If you're interested in meeting with her and you're a student, just contact Nance Silliman in, in the exhibitions office or she's on Blitzmail and you can blitz her yourself. Um, the exhibitions office is room 129 in the Hopkins Center across from the entry to the cafe. Uh, I'd like to invite everybody to a reception immediately following the talk in the Jaffe Freedy Gallery, and please welcome Rebecca Purdom. I read recently that uh, light changes almost everything it hits. And when we see color, it's because light has caused the electrons of whatever it's shining on to rearrange themselves, absorbing some energy and reflecting the rest out as color. So I thought maybe it's possible when I'm looking at a painting, let's say a Rembrandt, that I'm being affected by its light in exactly the same way that Rembrandt was when he painted it. That by looking at the painting, I'm being literally rearranged to be more like the artist. And I thought this explains something about 
myself, something about my nature, until I happened to ask the opinion of a cellular biologist, someone who worked with electron microscopes. And he said because pigments, the actual pigment in the paint, changes over time, that no, the effect wouldn't be the same. But I wasn't discouraged because when I stand in front of a painting, in front of that Rembrandt, I know I'm standing in the same relative position to it that Rembrandt did and that he touched it and that he picked it up and carried it around and that he painted it. And because this connection is very important and because my paintings are hanging now in the Jaffe Friedi Gallery for you to see. I'm not going to show you slides. And I'm not going to test your patience with a PowerPoint presentation this afternoon. I'm just going to talk about being a painter. But first, I want to thank you. I see a lot of new faces, and I see a lot of familiar ones here today. And it means a great deal to me that you came. And I'd like to thank Dartmouth College and the entire studio art department and their faculty for inviting me to be artist in residence. And I'd also like to acknowledge the students. I look forward to seeing your work in the coming weeks. And I hope you come to see me too, because we have a lot in common. And I kept you in mind while thinking about what to say this afternoon. And the most recent thing we've shared is moving here to Hanover. Um, but unlike some of your previous artists in residence, I didn't have to travel far. As Jerry mentioned, um, for the past 15 years, I've lived in Vermont. But before that, I moved regularly, even as a kid. We were back and forth across country a couple of times and up and down the East Coast. And after college, I moved to Manhattan, where I lived for 11 years. I moved four times in the city and five more times after leaving New York. But I don't think it's all that unusual. But every time I had to move, I moved to studio too, just like this time. And it's interesting in a new studio, because unlike unpacking a suitcase, the moment I unpack my box of paint, the way the tubes and cans look and feel, a familiar and essential anxiety is released. It's a feeling I've known almost my entire life. It's the anxiety that accompanies painting. It's the anxiety of starting over which is something you do again and again with every painting. And even though you start over when you move into a new place to live, it's a different kind of beginning. I've always liked the way a room looks and feels before I move in. It feels empty, good and empty. But in the studio, even a room that you turn into a studio, one that's never had an artist in it before. When I unpack that box of paint, and probably contributing to that anxiety, the memory of all the paintings I've ever done is released into that space. And somehow those paintings encompass what was going on when they were made more precisely, more tenderly than the typical stuff that survives move after move. Even more important, that memory also encompasses all painting. In fact, all kinds of art and the artists who create it. So this new studio space immediately becomes crowded with the familiar. It's as if I've never left a place I've never been before. In other words, art has been the one constant in my life. 
And I think this is or will be true for you too. A year from now, everything will be different in some big or small way. Where you live and work and the people around you and certainly anything that you might pack in a suitcase will be different. But art, and I'm not talking about the things you make. I'm talking about the art that has compelled you to pursue whatever it is you do, does not change. And this constancy is a gift. And it's probably the most important thing we have in common. It will give you strength. It won't necessarily make you happy, but it will make you strong, as it has for me, and it will sustain you throughout your moving, changing life, even when you're unable to make the things you make. But that's a subject, really, for a different lecture. <laughs> I'd like to talk about abstraction. And it's an art form known best like just about everything by actually doing it. And I would bet that every one of you has painted so you understand what I'm saying. But even looking at an abstract painting, one experience a physical impulse because how it's painted and the painting itself are usually one and the same. If you're looking at a line drawn across the surface of a canvas, you know how to do that. Again, you understand it on a very basic level. And if it moves you, if you feel caught by an undefined emotion, you are the painting in that moment, you are the experience, and your feet are somehow a little bit off the ground. The first time this happened to me was in the Rothko room at the Tate many years ago. And it was an answer to what I was then asking, what can abstract painting do? Why be an abstract painter? And this kind of aesthetic experience has less to do with what the painting actually looks like what style or type of painting, for example, but everything to do with what many painters describe as in between. And you may have heard this expression before. It's an elusive state. I've looked at a lot of art, and I don't always have this kind of experience, but I'm patient now about waiting for it because more and more, it requires the kind of extraordinary looking that overwhelms judgment. It's not just in the work of art. It's not just in you, in your mind, or in your heart. It's something that manifests itself in the experience between them all. And at this unique time, I think this is the reason for my being here, for being your abstract painter, artist in residence to remind you of the in-between that is constantly in all we do. And it takes patience, I think, because painting seems to have its own nature, one you really can't predict. If I make a mark to look like something, that might not be painting. That's more like determination. I'm predicting what the painting will eventually look like, and I might even assume how you'll react to it. But I don't want to know what my painting is going to look like. In fact, what it looks like is just one small part of a much greater purpose. I went to visit a friend once. And she and her husband lived out on Cape Cod. And when I got there, we sat at her kitchen table and talked. She was a painter, too. And after a while, she said she wanted to start getting dinner ready. So I asked if I could help. And she said, you can bring me that clam. And as I remember it, her small kitchen was dominated by an enormous old stove. And on the front burner was a pan with water in it that had recently boiled. 
and in the water was a big clam. So I went over and I poured off the water and I put the clam on a plate and I brought the plate over to the table and she looked at it and then at me and she said, I wanted the water. <laughs> even, even if you've been told exactly what to look for, even if you know exactly what to look for, sometimes what you're after isn't it at all, but everything around it. And that's abstract painting. It forces you to doubt your determination and to second guess your assumptions, which is difficult to do because we depend on our assumptions. They are very practical and they save a lot of time. But abstraction is about as impractical an art form as there is. It takes time to make, it takes time to look at, and it takes time to respond to, which puts it at odds with the world we've created with our assumptions. And this just might be the thing I love most about abstract painting, especially when you think about its history. If you'll agree just for the sake of argument that 1915 is when abstract painting first found a secure place on art history's timeline, then it's approaching its 100th birthday. And I don't think that's so old considering the history of art. But it's been around long enough to be, um, to be tolerated, like somebody you have to invite to a party even though you'd really rather not. <laughs> and I think one reason why is because it is so impractical. To use the United States as an example, its most comprehensive movement in abstraction took a long time. And of course, I'm talking about the abstract expressionists beginning in the late 1930s all the way through the 1950s. That's at least 20 years, one-fifth of abstraction's entire timeline. And by the 60s, everything, and I mean everything, began to speed up, including the amount of time we were willing to spend in front of a painting. Our attention went to more popular things and art and artists also became very popular and very useful. But use implies a cost of one sort or another. And not all, but a lot of abstract painters reacted to this by, by intellectualizing their process. It took the guesswork out of abstraction by reinterpreting its original sacred geometry and that made it, if not easier, then at least a little faster. But something was lost along the way, the kind of emotional sweep worth succumbing to. And I think it's risky, even a little embarrassing, to succumb to paint now. It's easier to use it the same way we'd use any tool available to us. But in my experience, I've found that it's not the same no matter how talented we are at manipulating it to look like or describe something else, it remains beyond us by remaining itself. We don't realize it because we're using paint as color. And there's hardly a quality more powerful than color. And this is, I'll admit, a perpetual challenge for me. At some point though, usually after I've scraped a lot of it off, the effect of color shifts away from description to painting. And it might be helpful if I use this analogy, since we're here in the White Mountains. Let's say you've decided to hike up above tree line and you're tearing from a branch that switched across your eye, and you're overheated, 
and breathing hard from the effort. That's what color is for. But you're hiking to the top, and when you get there, it's only rock, because you're still looking down at your feet. And when you're ready, you look up, and it's only sky, and there's nothing up there to hold on to. That's the effect of paint. And that is the challenge in your studio, pursuing what Kazimir Malevich called eternal artistry. Eternal artistry. And in order to do this, you have to prepare yourself to be receptive to the kind of experience that has nothing to do with practical matters. And it may sound strange, but when you're worn down from trying to figure out what to paint, and exhausted from caring about something you must ultimately discard, then you have no choice but to pay attention to what is right in front of you. The process is a long, impractical one. And it may take 100 paintings. It may take 500, a lifetime of paintings. It is a process perfected through this trial of failures. In other words, it's the attempt to realize something absolute while refusing to accept its impossibility. And I think the greatness of abstraction is in communicating this paradox with so much beauty. The course of abstract painting is, I hope, still eternal and useless. And its future continues to be in the singularity of its process. A person in a room being changed by the awareness that comes through painting. And this directly affects their actions outside that room. It sounds vaguely monastic. Well, maybe paint and painting answer the kind of calling that tests our aesthetic faith. And if we've learned one thing in a century of abstract painting is that it takes a lot of faith. In other words, strength to be alone in the studio. But remember what I said earlier, strength is what art gives you. So a finished painting leads to the next one. Your commitment to that continuity gives it meaning. How you change through your effort is its purpose. And all the while, your painting, thankfully, remains a painting. <coughs> and before I close, I should say a few words about the paintings in the show. I think if you take, you, you think of a scientist taking a core sample of the earth, um, any section from that sample will tell a different story. And the paintings we chose are basically three sections from a 26 year sample. They're not the whole story by any means, but they're representative of their times. There is a common thread though running through the work. When artists are sitting in their studios wondering what to paint, there are an infinite number of choices to pick. But we predictably choose this same one over and over again, ourself. And making pictures about ourselves is one of the things we do best. And you can use paint to make those pictures, but that doesn't necessarily make you a painter. And as I said before, I found this out by putting on and scraping off a lot of paint. When I started, I wanted somehow to use paint to express what I was feeling. But over time, the act of painting makes me less and less sure about just what I feel until the very last mark, the very last instant I touched the canvas because by that time, I don't have anything to do with it. It's as if the whole process has been one of leeching out myself, my particular feelings, and replacing them with the nonspecific emotion of painting. And it's interesting how it changes each time. 
but even if they look different when they're finished, the paintings all begin exactly the same way with the first mark. The very first mark that ruins the perfection of a blank canvas. And every one of my paintings is the result of trying to find that perfection again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I don't know if uh, anybody has a question or if you had a chance to uh, see the show. You know, I think that was beautifully expressed. I'm really, you know, very moved by what you said. I have one, but I wonder, when you look at that Rembrandt, do you find him less sacred because of the <coughs> representation? Oh, because of, because of. Because of the representation of No. Oh, absolutely not. No, I, I look at I look I look at all painting the, the the same the same way. I really do, and when I talk about being patient about about it, I, I think you really do have to take the time to sit and look at it, whatever whatever it is, and uh, and allow the painting to to tell you how to feel. And it doesn't matter whether it's abstract or representational. It doesn't matter to me at all. Yeah. I mean, if it's a good painting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it's a bad painting, yeah, I guess that, that holds true if it's a bad painting, too. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nobody else? <laughs> oh my, have I stumped you? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I like the <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the clam story was just really a very simple example of being told to go get something and then completely, you know, not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, throwing it away. <laughs> and, um, and I, I don't know. I mean, what what ex what exact? What's your question exactly? I mean, just like, um, well, I, you know, I, I like the clear canvas, and uh, you know, some composers deal with like you know, like very, uh, it's very clear that they have point like um, maybe Bach, for example, he has a lot of form, and so it's very clear he's talking about the notes. Like Chopin is a romantic composer, and he likes to talk about the space. Well, I think it does. Um, th there's a there's a nice story that Glenn Gould talks about when he was uh, young, practicing at the piano, and uh, a vacuum cleaner started up. You know this story, everybody? Vacuum cleaner started up beside the instrument while he was playing, so he couldn't actually hear what he was playing, but he could feel it. And I think that, uh, and, he, and, he, and he said he thought it sounded better than it had without the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's something, it, it, it's something that you do totally. And I think when I'm talking about, you know, every th what's in between and what's around uh, what it is you're doing, that, th that's what, that's what that is. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. No. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Have you tried other mediums? And if so, what? I um I work on paper with gouache and ink and pencil, and I d I do that, and it's different. I mean, every medium is different, so it, so it it does require a different uh, a different way. Of painting, and they tend, and my work on paper tends to look a little different than the oil paint. I, 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 I think my, um, I feel the oil paint better. 
than other medium. And um, I, I think that part of it is just the paint itself, its physical qualities that I think are, are really beautiful that I seem to have an affinity for. But I have tried others, and I still do. I have to work much, much, even harder, <laughs> I think. Personally, uh, I find myself deeply moved by a lot of types of art, art. But I know a lot of, uh, even a lot of my own uh, friends, a lot of people um, approach an abstract piece um, and are quickly, they're confused and lost, and usually frustrated. Um, <coughs> and I think maybe part of that is, is uh, you know, not, not, being necessarily educated in art history specifically. Um, but I guess my, my question is, um, do, you, do you worry that by, by choosing an abstract medium that you aren't, that there is a, a group of people that you aren't able to speak to? Or do you just, I mean, how, what, is, what is your uh, uh, reaction to this? I never for a moment, even from the beginning, ever thought that anybody would be interested in my painting other than me. And so when, when to, to, to even, even if it's two people or five people, it, it's, a, it's really astounding to me and wonderful. And it's remarkable, actually, that you, you meet as many people as you do that, that, that do understand it or feel it, or, or feel it even in their own, their own particular way. You don't have any control over how people look at the work and how they feel, uh, you know. And why would you? I don't want that control. It's, you know, it's uh, the experience of, of painting. The painting is is really one thing, and then what happens when it's done is is a is a is a different kind of thing. And I, um, sure, you, if the more you know about particular artists, you know that yeah, that sure that can help. That can can add to the experience. I don't think it's particularly necessary. I think what really is important is, is time. Time to look at it a little bit and let it work on you. I, I mean, I've, I've seen a number of people go into a gallery and will, will try to um, figure out the paintings. You know, oh, that's, as long as, as somehow if they can define it somehow and say that's, oh, I don't know, a sunset or whatever it is, you know, um, then, uh, I think that's the reason why it's nice to have the benches in the gallery. <laughs> you can sit down and let the paintings work on you a little bit. You know, I had this experience. I had a, a large vertical blue painting, and uh, someone came up to me and, and, and told me that it reminded her of Niagara Falls. And I said, oh, well, when have, when'd you go? She said, well, I've never been there. And I said, well, I've never been there either. And so it just, you know, it didn't make any, and it didn't have anything to do with Niagara Falls, <laughs> you know? So, uh, but, uh, I mean, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Bob. Is the uh, painting different for you when you are working on it, and then after it's finished, and you look at your own work as you would work right now? If the painting doesn't stay interesting to me, my own painting, um, and it takes it takes a couple of months, because usually while, when I finish the painting, I'll turn it around and I won't look at it for a while, and then I'll if it I turn it around again after some time has passed, and if it doesn't catch me, then it's 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 over. I take it off the stretcher bar, and that's it. Start over again. And um, I think pretty much every Rembrandt that I've gone s had the chance to see, I've I've always been caught by it. I haven't, I haven't ever thought, gee, you know, that's not, that's not so good. <laughs>
No, I, it's, I think it's deeper when it's done, when I look at it. When I start, you know, everything, everything goes into the painting. You know, all of that, all, ruining all of that perfection. And then little by little it goes away. And, and then when it reaches the end and it's, and it's out and the painting is finished, it's, it's as perfect as I can make it. And if, and if, it's, if, if it lasts, then, then, then that, when I look at it again, when it's done, the perfection is there, at least for me. And so, yeah, it's better. Chi? This is a question in response to <coughs> having comments about You don't even know why or what we're making, but we're making, and they're important to us, pretty much. And and my my feeling about your work is is kind of like what? <coughs> why don't we always paint more? Because that's the question that pops in my head first. And then second, when you're working small, is is it, is it what is compels me? It is different, you know, physically it's different. And I think, um, when I work on a large painting, well, I, I generally work on one painting at a time. But um, when I'm working on a large painting, I have a little, like a panel, a little panel on, on the easel off to the side. And whatever paint I have left over from what I'm working on the large one, I just go and I put it on that little panel. And so it's n after a couple of months, you know, that little panel has uh, a lot of paint on it that that um, that I can go right into and work on. And somehow I think it makes it familiar to me because I've, it's not that I've painted it. I mean, I've, I've painted it. I haven't made a painting, you know what I mean? I've just put paint on it. And so when I'm done with the big painting, then I can turn that around and then just immediately go and work on the little one. And somehow, f I think because physically I've extended myself in the big one, then, then it's, it's less of an issue in dealing with that little space. I'm, I'm not explaining it very accurately, but I, I, I hope you understand. Um, but it is different. You're absolutely right. And I think I try to ease that difference by building up on the panel as the, I'm painting on the big one. It somehow balances it for me. Yes? Uh, you partly answered this question by answering the last one, but take any of the large canvases that are in the gallery. Um, how long do you work on them? And, and do you put them aside and then continue to work on them? What's the time frame they look uh, of these paintings that I've seen, say, to me? Somebody's given a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, that, I'll stop there. They, um, they, they, they're taking longer and longer. Um, and I, I, th I think, th th you know, at average, I don't know, at average, th each one's different. Some happen very quickly, and some, some take a lot longer, up to maybe three or four months. And, 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 the little, and that doesn't make any difference what size they are. Sometimes the little ones take even longer. Um, uh, um, Would you work on them almost every day? Um, no. I'm in the studio every day, but I'm not painting every day. I'm looking. I do a lot of looking. And, um, um, but almost every day. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, when, you know, when the painting is done and I, I turn it, I turn it around so I don't see it, and then I might start on another one, a little painting or some other painting. 
um, it uh, those I, I don't, it, 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 it seems continuous to me. I guess that's why I hesitated when I said I don't, I want to be truthful. I don't actually put paint on every day, but I, I, I guess I paint every day. Yeah, yeah. You know, I talked about that anxiety. I, part of it is 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 um, sustaining yourself, and that and that anxiety of just of of keeping uh, going. And so that first part of that is is it's it it's to keep it going. And even though sometimes you you know I I think well I, I don't need to do this. You know, I don't need to put this mark on here. I could go sit outside, you know. But I, but I put the mark on there, and then I'm compelled to keep on going, you know. The, um, you know, when I talked about a greater purpose, you know, I'm not just in there making paintings. I mean, oh, another painting, another painting. I'm really trying to be changed by what I'm doing. And so, uh, so there's a little bit, that, that anxiety, there's a little bit of fear in that. Because you know you don't know how it's going to change you by the time you get to the end of that painting, and uh, you know it's not always successful. Sometimes it is, <laughs> not always. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> Uh, no, and, and often, um, I usually start with all, whatever I have the most, what paint I have the most of. It may be left over from a painting, <laughs> I don't know, you know, from what I just did, or it's, or it's a lot of, you know, I seem to always have a whole lot of yellow. I don't know why, and so generally that first mark is yellow, and then, and, 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 and you know, when I talk about the effect of color, that, and how powerful that is, you know, I, uh, um, I usually paint then put all that on there until it's, I paint yellow until it's not yellow anymore, or blue, or whatever it is that I have the most of. And, and so it kind of, it goes back and forth. But it's, it's different, I, yeah, I, I'm, it might be anywhere on the, on the, on the canvas. It's, and it's different all that, you know, it, I'm not particular that way, getting started. <laughs> yeah, oh, Francis? Um, you mentioned three sections of 46 years of work, and I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about what the, the, three, sections the three sections are. are. Yeah. Um, in the show, there are there are there are two large paintings to the left when you go in, and then there are nine panel paintings, and then there are what four four paintings, larger paintings over to the right, and those that the 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 nine panel paintings represent those 26 years. So the very first one on the left is from 1983, and the very last one on the right is right now, my most recent painting. And the, um, the two paintings, the dark, the black and white ones on the left, 2000 and 2001, sort of in the middle. And then the ones on the far right are more recent ones, just for the last couple of years. And, um, it's probably easiest to talk about those panel pa panel paintings because the first three are from basically the 1980s and the middle three are from the 90s and the last three are from right now. And, uh, and we, I, I, I don't know, I think I, I had them in the, st all the work is from, from the studio. And when we, we had them all out and pulled them out, pulled them out, they all, they seemed to make sense somehow together. Um, so, so that's what it is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, if you have any advice for a young person aspiring to become an artist, how to go about it? To be an artist? I, 
I think, you know, a lot can be said for doing, you know, being practical. But I think the very, the most important thing is the work. And until you've got enough work, and um, I think that takes a little bit of time. And, and, and it's not just to have like a body of work to show around. It's to, to, to know yourself really well and to know um, what it is you exactly want. Because I don't know how, being an artist today, it, 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 it's huge, that definition. I mean, you can do so many things as an artist today. Um, it's a little different being a painter, I think, because it's, it, it, it's limited, I think, in a very beautiful way. But as an artist, I, um, I really think you have to be very, very honest with yourself in what you're trying to do and what your, what your purpose is. Um, Actually, Colleen, that's a really big question. I don't, I can't answer it right now. I'll talk to the students and <laughs> I'll think about it and I'll, and I'll come up with a better answer than one right off the bat right here, so, <laughs> yes. I have two questions about the process. One is very simple. Okay. The first one is how do you reach the tall part? How do you physically paint something so big when you're so tiny? And the second one, <laughs> the second one is, um, do you, I understand that the work generates from that first mark that spoils the perfection of the other things. Does all the work generate then from that first mark, or do you bring some sensation or memory or feeling in that's different to one painting than for another? Um, I climb up on a ladder. <laughs> and, uh, no, I climb down. I climb up and down. Yeah. Yeah. Up and down, up and down. <laughs> and back and forth and back and forth. Because, you know, when you're up close painting, it's very different when you get way back. And that's one of the most amazing things about the Jaffe Friedi Gallery. You get really far back in there and see the painting. Um, I would have to double the size of my studio now, <laughs> extend it out. Um, the first mark, the first mark I is every, it, it's, it's, it's everything. It's all the old paint or the paint that I have don't like, so I have too much of. And it's, it's y you, you don't operate in a vacuum. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on outside the studio. And, um, so all of, all of that that's going on in your, in your head has to uh, get painted, for me anyway, gets painted out. And that's why it takes so long. Um, and, I th and I think I really work until I have that kind of aesthetic experience that is really important to me. And so it means spending a lot of time with the painting until it's just the painting. So yeah, that in the beginning, it's... it's uh, I guess it's loaded. That is that loaded brush. You never even thought about the, the pun, but that's probably what it's, what it means. Yeah. Yes. I find it interesting what you said about perfection and the way you talked about painting sounded very similar to the way some people talk about spirituality. And I was wondering if you have anything more you want. Well, you know, I think, uh, what is it? I don't make a specific connection. Um, but I think it's all related. Sure, absolutely. But I don't make, I don't make a conscious effort to, to, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. I'm wondering what kinds of things nurture your work, um, the things that besides the actual painting itself, uh, you know, what's the medium in which your mind sits and thrives? Uh, I, uh, the natural world, probably. 
where where I live now, where my painting is, it's very uh, very rural, and um, and it's very important me to for, important to me to go out and walk, and uh, and it's not that I'm I'm you know bringing back the the forest or anything like that into my studio, but I think um, those um, the feeling of being s in something that's much much bigger than yourself. Uh, I think is really important. And um, you know, when I talked about going up above tree line, um, the very first time I did that, I, it, I've never forgotten it. And often, I, and often that kind of, that feeling of being up really high is really important to me. Or in the ocean, you know, when you're out in the ocean floating. That's really beautiful too. Those kinds of experiences, those, uh, they're the overwhelming kind of experiences I think are important to me. Yes. Okay. Ed Reinhardt was very influenced by ancient art, abstract art, and the early East India tantric art. Can you make a comment of this 1915 ancient abstract art? I know, I know, Reinhardt when 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 he was traveling, and he was looking at those kinds of things. I I know what you're referring to. I haven't had the opportunity to look at a lot. I mean, there's some. Some in the Met, there's that room in the Met, that I that that's very very fantastic. And I think that. Uh, I think the thing that that resonates with me, and that type of work. Is that there is a, that the all overness of it, the fact that the, the space is completely full in the work, and that, and I, But it seems, it still seems alive whenever I look at that. You know, I can feel a kind of life in it. And, you, you know, we talked about spirituality. It, I mean, it's related to that, but it's not obviously, I wouldn't want to be too specific about it. Um, it's interesting that you mention Ad Reinhardt, because after I wrote wrote this the notes to this talk today um, I was reading some of his one of his writings and um, you know art is uh, art is art book his book and he gave a talk it must have been about 50 years ago where he said that abstract painting is celebrating its 50th birthday and he was still talking about the same things and um, you know I talked about the studio being crowded with the familiar certainly adds floating around in there with me. He absolutely is. And um, I think that uh, the time that you have to take to look at his paintings is really important and important to me too. And one of the more wonderful things about his work. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't say for. S I can't put. Put my finger on it exactly. No. But it's there. It's certainly there. Are there older painters, um, like a generation or two above you, who who have personally um, helped you in some way to understand your work? Or, I don't, I'm not talking about promoting your work. I'm just talking, I mean, we, we learned from going to the Met of all these, and all the work we look at. Personal conversation and personal exchange with other artists, have, and that's not the old, I guess. Have there been any that have, and I wonder how. Um, yeah, I, I had the great good fortune of knowing, knowing several when I, when I, uh, 
was a very young painter in New York, and um, Joan Mitchell comes to mind, obviously. Um, and uh, Joan was incredibly generous with me. And, um, and, uh, and I, I, I've, t I've told this before, and some, some of you, this story before, and, and so forgive me, but, I, but um, I'll tell it again, because it still is absolutely true. And, and when Joan, I was uh, complaining to her that it was really hard to paint. And that I just sat in my chair all day. I couldn't, I couldn't get up out of my chair to paint. And she told me to squeeze a little white out onto my palette. And I said, white? Why white? And she told me that white dries the fastest and I won't want to waste the paint. <laughs> so that was really an important studio at the time with me. And, and the and the other the other artist that that, that I knew that was uh, helpful to me was uh, Milton Resnick, and actually it involves white as well. Because when I was at Skowhegan, that's where I first met Milton, and um, he came to my studio, and um, I was working on uh, an all over painting, and uh, he came in and uh, he said, "It needs some white." And I pointed to my palette, and I had a big gob of white all squeezed out, and that was going to be the next thing I put on. And he just patted me on the back, and he left. And I, I never saw him again that summer. But um, I, I had all the confidence in the world from that studio visit. I knew I, knew I was seeing something correctly in a painting. So thanks, everybody.